Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. As we gather for worship, I would draw your attention to the announcements which have been included in the bulletin. And Sharon is our announcer today. I'm not sure that's on. Now it is. So if you would ever like to be the announcer, <laughs> you can sign up for that now. We have a whole bunch of new jobs with regards to protocols for COVID-19. So instead of the bulletin now saying we need readers every Sunday, you might have noticed that it has changed to be screeners, ushers, readers, PowerPoint people, <laughs> and announcers. So if you would like to do the announcement sometime, or if you have an announcement, find out who has signed up to do that that Sunday and pass it along to them. The reason for that is because we're not supposed to use the same mic as someone else. So. Broadview subscriptions are due by September 30th. If you want to put your money in the offering box this today, we can make sure Carla gets it. If you aren't prepared today and you want to drop it off or e-transfer it into the office, Carla needs to know by the 30th so that she can send the information in for your name and address. So if your address has changed, you might want to let them know that too. Northreach Society is looking for things for women. Shampoo, conditioner, body soap, tampons, laundry soap, etc. There will be boxes out in the narthex and we will make sure that the uh, items are delivered. The GP food drive that we announced last week that is going until September 30th, uh, council voted to become a sponsor and we sent a thousand dollars from our outreach um, team and from the 53,000 that it was at last week, it has now gone up to 96,124 as of this morning. So it is rising, but it is far from the 250,000 they were looking for. So if you know someone that hasn't heard about it, please pass the message along that Food Drive is still going on and they do need our support. And that's all I have for today. And now that Sharon's just made a plea for people to sign up for announcers, that may change. Um, Allison and I met this, we'll say Thursday. Someday this week, Allison and I met. And as we moved to try to convince choristers to become soloists to sing our hymns for us, rather than using the videos, uh, we may then have those choristers be the announcer as well, for the same reason that Sharon mentioned, so we're not having to use multiple mics. So. That will be. We'll see what comes up by next Monday, by next Sunday, because Allison is is back starting October first. For our call to worship today, I thought we would go musical. As the candle flame flickers to light and then burns with a steady glow. Gathered as spirit filled disciples of Christ, we quiet our hearts for worship. Let us pray. Lift your voices, sing praise to the Holy One. Lift your hearts in thanksgiving. Open your eyes to see the great breadth of God's generosity. During this time of worship,
And may we leave this place We pray in the name of the one who taught us about God's abundant grace and who taught his friends to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from the thy kingdom, power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn comes from Voices United. Come, let us sing. Ashley, what is on Wednesday? Orange Shirt Day. Do you remember the story of Orange Shirt Day? That's right. It comes from there was one, a girl named Phyllis who had was given a bright new orange shirt when she was going to go to residential school, and she was very happy with it. But when she got to the school, one of the things they did at residential school when they, you got there is they took away everything that you had. All, everything that you brought from home, they took away. Well, they took away her shirt. So each year on September 30th, we're invited to wear an orange shirt as part of the way we remember residential school. Now Sharon has a story she's going to share with us. I'm going to be telling her story. I am now 73 years old. I was at Indian Residential School from age 11 to 15. I had to work in the infirmary where there were many sick and hungry children. I'd steal food like peanut butter and bread to feed them. A lot of kids died there. I had to handle the dead children, wrapping them to be buried. Once I got caught speaking my native language. I wasn't aware my language was different. My punishment was having four fingernails pulled out. At residential school, we all received numbers. I was known as number 702. But my name is Spenia. It's an Ojibwa name that means on my way. For many years now, I've worked as an advocate for abused children. I started a school for Indigenous kids in Vancouver called Spirit Rising Cultural Survival School. The photo was taken by Jeffrey Gibbs and I got his permission to share this story here today. Thank you, Sharon. So let's have a prayer. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, help us remember. Help us remember that sometimes we don't do the right thing. And so we hurt each other. And we're sorry. Help us change. Help us make it right. As we try to follow Jesus. Amen. As children of God, we come before God in prayer. 
God of the wilderness, you lead us through the deserts of our lives. God of the wilderness, as we travel through this time of challenge and chaos, God of the wilderness, when our unmet needs make us grumpy, when they blind us to your presence, God of the wilderness, as we grumble and complain, as we express our fears and anxieties and thirsts. The God who leads us into the wilderness walks with us on the way. God hears our cries and complaints and concerns, then, abide, then provides abundant sustenance to meet our needs. Then God calls us to keep following along the way with grace and mercy. God calls us to journey with God to the promised land. Amen. Our first reading today is from Exodus. It's actually all of chapter 17. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa, Test, and Meribah, Quarrel, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men for us and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the sun set, and Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a reminder in the book, and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, A hand upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Our next reading is from Psalm 105, the very beginning and the very end. There we go. 
go. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He brought Israel out with silver and gold, and there was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for covering, and a fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quails, and gave them food from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river, for he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the wealth of the peoples, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Here ends our readings for today. It's somewhat ironic that this week when I've been reflecting on the story of water from the rock, I've been thirsty all week. But first a story. There was a quirky little TV series on Canadian television. It's done now. This family, this fabulously rich, rich family got taken advantage of by their financial consultant and they lost everything. They lost their house, they lost their cars, they lost their planes, they lost their businesses. Except for this one, one asset. Which isn't quite how bankruptcy law usually works. Usually you at least keep, to get a, keep your house. But, but they had one asset left. Probably because nobody else wanted it. At some point, as a joke, the father had bought his son a town. I'm not sure how you buy a town. But the father had bought himself, his son a town, and it was the only asset they had left. So in this pro pilot episode, they all moved to the town. And it was not what they wanted. It was backward. They were living in what could charitably descri be described as a flea bag motel. The plumbing didn't work well. The one staff person was, well, she had customer service issues, as in she didn't really do it well. They didn't want to be there. Their needs weren't being met there. They thirsted, they yearned for what they had lost. The daughter was sure that her rich boyfriend was going to come and fly her away. That didn't happen. They spent years convinced that what they needed was to get out of the town and back to what was normal. But something happened. As they spent time in the town and had various adventures and misadventures, various attempts at starting a business, some successful, some well, we just will leave those in the other pile. 
as they became a part of the community. To their surprise, their needs were met. And what they were deeply yearning for, they didn't even know until they got there. They became connected with the four of themselves. People who, parents and children, didn't really know each other's lives. In fact, the mother, Moira, often said in that first season, we don't really know much about your life, and underneath it was, we don't really care. But their needs were met. Their thirst, their deep thirst that they didn't even know they had was met. And when the time came and the business ventures were taking off and most of the family was leaving, it was with great sadness because the town of Schitt's Creek had become their home. Sometimes when we're in the wilderness and we're yearning for something, that thirst gets met in a totally different way than we expect. The Israelites were, I'm sure when Moses said, we're going to go find a rock, and I'm going to hit the rock, and you're going to get water. How would you respond if you're dying of thirst and you're mad at this guy who's led you out to the desert to die of thirst, and he says, I'm going to go find a rock, and God's going to provide you water. There is a legend that that rock follows the people of Israel for the next 40 years, so they always have water. There's another legend about Miriam's well, that Miriam's well follows the people around, so they always have water. Because whatever else happens in the story of Exodus, the underlying theme is God will provide what you need. No matter how much you grumble, no matter how much you complain, no matter how much you're sure that God has gone away, that you're alone, God will provide what you need. God will satisfy that deep thirst. You just have to open your eyes and look for it whether it's white flaky stuff on the ground which we call literally what's this stuff? or water from a rock or as is often shared in modern survivalism water from a cactus because in the American deserts you can you know which cacti I'd find almost every cactus is non-toxic. You can get water from cactus. God will provide what you need if you know where to look, if you open your eyes, if you trust. And that's important that we remember to open our eyes and look and trust because when our needs aren't getting met, do you remember the Snickers ads? Snickers made a whole series of ads, one of which featured Betty White, because at that point in time, Betty White was in almost everything. And it would start with one person incredibly cranky, complaining, whining, and one of the other people in the ad would hand the person the Snickers and say, eat something. Why? Because you're not you when you're hungry. When our needs aren't getting met, when we have that sense that there's something missing, something we deeply need, it changes who we are. It changes how we act. When we're deeply thirsty, we can only focus on that thing we're missing, that thing we're yearning for. I mean, lack of water also does things like puts us to sleep, makes us, makes us drowsy, makes us confused, and definitely grumpy because dehydration headaches tend to do that. 
When we don't get what we think we need, we're different people. It's hard to be who God has formed us to be when we're sure that we're missing something. But we're called to trust that God will meet our needs. Sometimes in ways we don't expect. Water from a rock. Fellowship and renewed family from a small hick town living in a flea bag hotel. There are other examples of times when we were sure we needed this and God provided this but in a different way than we expected. And we we ended up in a different place. We ended up in a different understanding of life. We ended up living differently because our needs had been met and our eyes had been opened and we said, we're not alone. God's here. God's leading us to a new life. There's a new world somewhere they call the promised land. And I'll be there someday. If you just hold my hand, I still need you there beside me. Yes, it's a love song, it's a pop song, but it speaks to the way God works with us. Leading us to the promised land, helping to meet our needs, to fill our deepest thirst. There's a gospel story I think we need to tell in conjunction with water from the rock. It comes from the Gospel of John. Jesus, in the middle of the day, goes to a well in a, near a Samaritan town. His disciples go on into town to try to find food. And he's there alone, and a woman comes to the well. And they have a discussion. Jesus says, give me a drink. And she says, why dare you talk to me? I'm a woman, I'm a Samaritan, you're a male Jew, why are you talking to me? And they debate a bit. And Jesus says, whoever drinks from this well will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water I have to give will never thirst again. And she, taking him quite literally, says, well, tell me where this what well is. We follow the one who promises to assuage our deepest thirst so that we never thirst again. Even if we're in the midst of the wilderness, even if we're in the midst of hostile territory, even if we're sure we've been lost and abandoned, we follow the one who says, I've got something for you to drink. I'm going to meet your needs and you'll never thirst again. That's our hope. That's what leads us through the wilderness, is the promise that we're not alone, the promise that our needs will be met, that we'll get what we deeply need. It may not always be what we want. I have a whole different sermon on the difference between needs and wants. It was drilled into me as a child. It may not be how we think it's going to come. It may not be what we want, but our needs will get met. That's the promise God offers. Our needs will get met, we'll travel through the wilderness, we'll come out the other side to new life, to new hope. That's the promise. May God give us the ability to trust, to have our eyes opened so that the water will flow, our thirst will go away. Thanks be to God, who offers all these things, even if it's the middle of a wilderness, even if it's in hostile territory, or even if we find ourselves living in a flea bag hotel in a town which nobody really wants to name out loud. Amen. A hymn from More Voices.
like a healing stream. Our mission for minute story today comes from the Bissell Center, which is in the inner city in Edmonton. Our mission and service grants for community ministries like the Bissell Center and their outreach housing team offers hope for a safer, more prosperous future to many people like Joe. Joe had been living on the streets when he first moved to Edmonton to be closer to his children. His first visit to Bissell Center was for a shower and clean clothing. Afterward, he found a group of people sleeping under a gazebo together, using an electric blanket covered by a tarp to keep warm. We slept there, huddled there, just hoping to wake up in the morning. But after being robbed and left to freeze one night, Joe needed to make a change. Bissell Center's support worker helped him find an affordable apartment and piece his life back together. There were some nights when I wasn't sure I'd survive. If it wasn't for Bissell Center, I'd probably have frozen. But now I'm okay. I have my kids and family back, and I have a lot of support. And I have a beautiful home to call my own. He has a job. He volunteers at the center to give back to the community. None of this would have been possible without mission and service. With additional support from Gifts with Vision, over 45 people housed through Bissell Center's outreach housing team were given a gift when they moved into new housing last year. Items like pots and pans, utensils, and linen made them feel at home. Funds were also used to purchase bus tickets to help people get to apartment viewing secure a new identification, or obtain a criminal record check. If mission service giving is already a regular part of your life of faith, thank you so much. If not, I invite you to join me in making mission and service a regular part of how we live out our faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. There's the old saying, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I find it interesting that we just heard a story about housing in inner city Edmonton and the Bissell Center in this week when Edmonton's own tent city, although it's on the other side of the river, over by Strathcona, and not where the Bissell Center is, has been in the news so much as they try to figure out what it will take to clear out that camp and find it safe reliable, appropriate housing for those people. God speaks to us, encouraging us to care for our neighbors, encouraging us to do those things which make life better for all of us. That's what our offering is. That's what stewardship is. Stewardship, they say, is everything that happens after you say, I believe. Stewardship is our response to God's gifts. Sometimes it's gifts of money. Through your support of the local outreach fund, which has continued through this year, even with its disruption, we were able to make, as Sharon said, a thousand dollar donation to the food drive. Because the food bank has always been one of our partner agencies. Sometimes our offerings are less tangible. Our prayers, a phone call, our concerns. But all of them are ways we choose to respond to the gifts God has given us for the betterment of the world around us. That's stewardship. That's faith. And that's love. May we always offer what we've got to share.
as we open ourselves in prayer. We share those com those concerns, those celebrations. We share the things that are in our hearts and our souls. In our book today, we have prayers for Ursula Lewis, who is in palliative care at the care center. And is now one of the ironies of this COVID tide season is that once you're in palliative care, you're able to have visitors. But also the care centers have been given guidance from the province to start considering how they do visitors so there are more opportunities for visits to those people in care centers. Are there others we would name this morning? Yes, thank you to Leslie Ann for the summer, from month of September. Celebrate the low COVID rates in, in the peace area. Prayers for Kathy McLeod, who's in hospital with pneumonia. Holding these people in our hearts. We open ourselves to God in prayer. God of life. God who first moved over the waters and called out creation. God who meets our thirst, our deepest desires, our deepest needs. We lay ourselves, we lay our lives in your hands, we live in you. We share our hopes and our dreams. We share our fears and our nightmares. Our highest joys, our deepest sorrows. God of life, God of creation, God made known in water. We pray today for all and with all those who thirst, for those whose needs are not met. those with the whole, an empty spot in life. Gracious God, who offers us living water, respond to the thirsts and the needs and the yearnings of the world. We pray. God, who comes like a gentle rain to the thirsty ground, like a healing stream. God, who comes like a mighty sea roaring and thundering, like a river strong. We pray. We share our celebrations and we dance in the rain. God of living water, we dance in that well that never runs dry. And we sing songs of praise and thanksgiving for the water that washes us, that fills us, that refreshes. Helping us to be who we were called to be. God of life, of hopes and dreams, of fears and nightmares, of love, of joy, of sorrow, 
We share all our prayers of all our lives. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who we call the living water, who offers us to drink deep and live abundantly as we follow his path of love, of life, of the kingdom. Amen. O cloud of presence. I invite you to stand as we join together in our words of commission. God has led us this far in the wilderness of life. God has sent us springs of water in surprising places. Go with God, who protects, guides, and sustains us always.